Eu tenho mais falas. O que é com respeito a G alfa beta? Was that alpha x mu that beta x mu uh, is equal to half of G alpha beta and then del alpha x mu del alpha x. The raising is raising with the small sheet matrix G. So that's what you're doing, my part. This is the equation of motion with respect to G. Okay, now let's take the determinants of both sides. Okay. Uh, we write about minus signs at a moment. That's always tricky. But ignoring minus signs, we get a determinant of, uh, 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 of this object of uh, del alpha x mu del beta x mu. Uh, now what? We've got this as far as the matrix structure is concerned is a constant. It's two by two matrix, so the determinant is multiplied by constant square. <coughs> okay? So we get it is equal to half square, so that's one fourth times del alpha x mu del alpha x mu of x square times delta g. Okay, now we want to put the minus signs. You see, you know this is a, this we want a minus here, but we also want a minus in the delta g. So make it minus g. And then we get square roots of both sides. Okay, so we get square root of this is equal to half, we take a positive square root, uh, we take a positive square root, and the last sign convention, this is, this object without square is a negative length of the number. Okay, so we get minus, okay, and a square root. Okay, now, uh, 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 the minus sign is because you know our sign convention is uh, minus yes. plus one. Right. So the time derivative is negative of the space derivative. Okay? But the time derivative always dominates the space derivative. The time derivative is an energy, space derivative is momentum, energy is always larger than <laughs> So in our sign convention, this quantity as written is a negative quantity. Okay? So we're taking we've got a positive number. We're taking its square root, and we're using the convention of the square root. Square root has two possible values, plus something or minus something. We're using the convention that we get the positive number, the positive object. Okay, that's what we mean. More data sets. So that's why I put the minus. Is this here? I mean, it's just a matter of convention. Okay, so therefore, this thing, just, just to say it again, if this is going to have a kinetic term, and the kinetic term in this in this action will be positive with the structure side. So I think there's a two H in that expression that is coming up. And otherwise we this is not much. Oh, okay, you will extend all I'm great. Okay. Therefore, uh, we find that uh, this action. It's the same thing. Um, this half is this half. It's minus of this sign. This is as that. That's my substitution. Is this here? Uh, well, we wanted it. Oh, yeah. I do the minus. Sorry. Um, okay. Good question. Do the minus. Uh, we have written the minuses don't match, right? So let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Uh, this let's see that's wrong. Uh, okay, sorry. Yes. Um okay, let's see. Let's, let's, let's see. We want something that is positive. Uh, minus sign won't be there. Yes, minus sign won't be there. Uh, possibly, uh, I mean, because we took a square root uh, of the thing, so there are two signs which are positive. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, it's not so clear to me actually because of our, our sign convention we have negative type there. Yeah, uh, but there is a minus sign again in uh, push. Uh, okay, yeah, of course, in take the square root, we have this plus minus ambiguity. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, just a minute. Sign. Was this the right sign to start with? Uh, but this doesn't want the value because it was a good number And certainly, this is the right, uh, certainly, we want to get this because otherwise, it won't make sense. This, these two signs should be the same. Um, but what's looking puzzling is that if by the square root we mean uh, the positive square root, this looks like a negative definite object. Whereas this looks like a uh, uh, positive.
we've introduced three new degrees of freedom, but we've only got two new equations. And we've only got two equations. Only two of these, and you can easily check that the other two equations aren't true. Okay? So, so two of the three new e degrees of freedom that we've introduced is determined by, uh, by this constraint equation that we found. But the third one is not. Given that, okay, given that, how, how did it happen, given that, how did it happen that we managed to get the same actions in the two sides? Well, what happened to that third, the third free degree of freedom? Since we got the same action, you know, we got an action plugging in with this equation of motion that didn't depend on this third free degree of freedom, it must be that that third free degree of freedom just doesn't enter the action at all. Okay, let's see how that works. Let's look at this action here. Okay, now consider um, consider two different metrics, g tilde, which is equal to g g alpha beta times g alpha beta times e to the power of phi. Okay, where phi is an arbitrary function of of your g coordinates. Okay, now under this transformation, what happens? Uh, to all the fields that in this action. Well, square root minus g alpha beta uh, tilde alpha beta is equal to e to the power of 2 phi by 2. The 2 phi is because the determinant scales like a square, and the by 2 is because we take the square root of square root g alpha beta. But also g inverse, so g alpha beta tilde is e to the power minus phi g tilde g alpha beta. Now this action has both the square root determinant as well as the g alpha beta. There are no derivatives anywhere on the metric. Okay? So you plug this in and you find you get exactly the same action for g and g tilde. Okay? So there is a huge symmetry in this action. Okay? The symmetry has a name, it's called y symmetry. So this action has a symmetry on the y part. Okay? Two different metrics that are related to each other by rescaling with a function of one sheet coordinates give you the same functional form of the action. Okay? It's because the action has this wire symmetry, it's varying with respect to this direction in field space. <coughs> gives you no, no equation of motion. And varying with respect to this direction in field space, you can easily convince yourself it's the same state of the trace of these. Because you're varying with respect to the direction and field space in which the whole metric is changing in an overall way, uh, which is uh, which you can convince yourself is uh, basically the trace of this of this equation. This equation wasn't kept from varying all the components separately, but if you varied in a way that was proportional to the metric, you know it would be g alpha beta, the thing that Sylvia Moy had. The variation is proportional to delta g alpha beta is proportional to g alpha beta, and therefore that trace. Okay, so we've discovered the reason for our equations of motion being too few to solve for this new degree of freedom. The reason is that of the action we wrote down, this new fantasy action we wrote down, had a big symmetry. Now, what is the consequence of this? The consequence of this is that, as we have seen, as we have seen, um, if we are given a solution to uh, to the equations of motion that come from this action. That solution determines, you know, two of the three components of the metric G alpha beta, but the third component is completely arbitrary. Okay, as far as this action is concerned. So, strictly speaking, as dynamical systems, these two actions are not the same. For every solution to the equation of motion here, there's an infinite number of solutions to the equation of motion here. There means solution with any given metric times all possible y transformations. Is this clear? Okay? So, while a naive manipulation leads you to suspect the bit, it seems to imply that this action and this action are the same classical systems, that is not quite true. There is an infinite number of more solutions <laughs> equation of motion of this than of this. Okay. Now. Extra degrees of freedom is not dynamical. So. It's not dynamical, yes. but if you try to do a quantization of the system, you see, 
quantization is quantization of phase space, and you would find a huge additional, you know, a much larger phase space in the second system. Okay, but your point is completely right. It is now dynamical, and that's what we're going to use. So I want to do that. It's, it's completely correct. Okay. Maybe the, the problem with Mary was that even though we've got lots of degrees, you know, new solutions, these new solutions are each related to each, related to each other by symmetry. So how do we make these two dynamical systems the same? We make these two dynamical systems the same if we supplement this theory by a statement. The statement that we are going to take the symmetry and gauge it. Okay? Take the symmetry and treat the solutions that are related by y transformations as the same solution. Once we do that, we have made the two dynamical systems the same. Is this clear? Okay. Now, uh, you see, we have now incre increased the, the gauge invariance in our system. In the original action itself, we had a reparametrization invariance. And we agreed last class that we should be thinking of the system as being gauged by this reparametrization. Two solutions that differ only by reparametrization are the same solution in space time, same, same physical motion in space. Now, once we've gone to this new form of the action, this form of the action, we have inherited a third gauge invariance. Two solutions should be regarded as the same physical solution if they differ by either a reparametrization invariance or by a wide risk. Okay. It is with this understanding that this action is the same as this action. As a classical dynamics. Is this clear? Okay? So it is this understanding that we're going to keep in our mind now in order, in order to try to make a quantum theory, uh, starting with the second action, which is a much easier job than stuff. Is this clear? Any questions or comments before we proceed? Okay, so let's move on. So let's clear everything and write a little more systematically. Now our plan for this lecture and the next, oh sorry, by the way, just one a comment about schedule. I realized that there were conflicts uh, on Tuesdays. So we're back to our uh, Wednesdays and Friday schedule, okay? Wednesdays and Fridays, that's written in stone, and this is a really good reason to go change. Okay? Fine. So, what we're going to do in the next, in this lecture and the next one, is, and perhaps the next one, is perform an honest quantization. Is perform a quantization of this action, the string action. We're going to do this in two steps. In this lecture, I'm going to try to get to the result as fast as I possibly can using slightly slipshod techniques. We're trying to be as honest as we can. In the next two lectures, we'll go over. Well, may take a little more than the next two lectures. But in the next few lectures. We will go back and revisit the question and discuss it very carefully using advanced and interesting techniques of conformal field theory on the question strip. But first, before we get into deep, you know, before we get into formalism, let's let's try to study the answer in a slightly slipshod way. Okay. So, 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 what's our what's our goal? Our goal is to take this action, which is minus t. Okay. Now I'm going to switch to the conventions used in strip theory. T. What was t? The coefficient behind the action was the tension of the string. Right? Uh, now, uh, it's, con in conventional, it's uh, conventional to write t as equal to 1 over 2 pi at um, Let's Let's look at dimensions. Tension is mass per unit length. Okay? The mass, energy are all the same dimension because h cross is 1. And mass and inverse this because c is 1. And mass and inverse distance are also the same, same dimension because h cross is 1. Okay? So we've got mass per unit length, which is 1 over length squared. Okay? Therefore, this quantity, this alpha prime, is a quantity of, of dimensions length squared. Square root of alpha prime is a length, and uh, is a famous length. It's going to be, it's, uh, we, we will encounter it all through our study of string theory. It's the length associated with the size of strings. Called the string scale. Okay? At the moment, this is just a change in location. But the square root of alpha prime will be the length scale that will appear all through us. Okay, so t was this, uh, but now our action was minus t by 2, so minus 1 by 4 pi alpha, right? An integral square root of minus g, 
del alfa x, mu del alfa x. Okay, the way it's supposed to understand how to, how to deal with this action, uh, uh, treating the uh, retard factorization invariance and wire transformations as means of interest. Okay, now what I'm going to do is in order to quantize this theory in the fastest, yet honest, in an honest way, but in the fastest way that I can, is use a mishmash of the methods that we used last class, all of which we understood very well for, for the case of the path. The first, the first thing I'm going to do is to use an analog of method number four. The last method, if you remember, was to take an action that had a gauge symmetry, fix gauge, but be careful about dealing with the constraints that accompany the gauge fixing. Okay? So, let's see. So, what, what are gauges? We've got reparameterization invariance. How many functions of reparameterization invariance in two dimensions? How many, this is how many functions worth of invariance? Two. two functions worth of invariance. That's two. And we've got wider than invariance. How many functions worth of invariance here? One function. So we've got a total of three functions worth of invariance. You know, functions of the worksheet worth of invariance. It should be possible to use these three functions to set any three other dynamical functions to be something specific. Up to possibly discrete ambiguities or something like that, which we'll deal with carefully the next few days. Okay? So, what we are going to try to do is to set, what we are going to try to do is to set this G alpha beta, okay? G alpha beta to the form e to the power phi eta alpha beta using reparameterization invariance. And then to set the same thing to eta alpha beta using y. Okay? Now there are immediately questions of can you do it? Can you always take any metric and use reparameterization invariance to set it to this form? After which, of course, you can always set it to this form as well. These are interesting questions which depend on many details. It depends on the space in which you're in and so on. We will analyze all these questions in detail in, the, in a few lectures. But for now, we're going to forget some subtleties. They affect small things, but not gross. Yeah? And pretend we can always do it. Okay? Pretend we can always do it. So this is the gauge that we're going to set. Okay. Once we have set our gauge, our action becomes enormous extremes. Our action becomes S is equal to minus 1 by 4 pi alpha prime square root of uh, my, well, there's no minus g now, so it's just del alpha x mu del alpha x mu, where the contraction is now done using the flat space metric in two dimensions. Okay, this is a system of three bosons in two dimensions, which anyone can solve. Okay, great. But of course, in fixing gauge, in fixing gauge, there are two things. There are two things you have to worry about. Okay. Um, the first thing we have to worry about is the constraints that were associated with the gauge fixing. Okay? So let's worry about that. Now the constraints associated with the gauge fixing were the equations that Jyoti is going to write for us in this class. They were the equations of motion with respect to the objects that we fixed. Which was d alpha x mu, d beta x mu is equal to uh, square root of g, but that's a now since square root of g is just one, or you know, square root of minus g is just one, if minus half uh, del alpha x mu del oh okay, there was no square so this is g alpha beta del alpha x mu del alpha okay so we have to do our, our quantization consistent with, with, with these constraints. So these are, oops, these are constraints. Okay. Okay. Now, in order to understand what these constraints are, it's useful to use an, in, a nice set of coordinates on the world sheet of the string. 
Okay? So, what is it about going to introduce you? Uh, the light like coordinates of the world shape strip. So far, we've been using these, these coordinates sigma and tau, in terms of which we've chosen the metric, or let's say tau and sigma, in terms of which we have chosen the metric to be minus 1 and 1. Okay? But let's now move to a new set of coordinates, sigma plus, which is tau plus sigma, and sigma minus, which is tau minus sigma. And let, let's write everything on the world sheet string, everything in action, in terms of these variables. Every derivative in terms of der derivatives for sigma plus and sigma minus. So we're going to transform this action into that form. That's very easy to do. So let's, let's, let's remind ourselves uh, how things work. Firstly, about the action. Okay. This thing was just, was minus del tau squared of x plus del sigma squared of x. Uh, but there was a minus sign, so that's a plus and minus. Okay, okay. but there's minus sign, so this is plus and minus. Okay, and now let's rewrite this into, uh, let's see if we can find a simple expression in terms of plus and minus derivatives of x that gives us the same thing. Well, so let's see. So del tau, so let's use the chain rule of partial differentiation. So suppose you've got del A, this is the same thing as del XA by del YB, B by D, XA. Okay? Now, we know what sigma, we know what um, uh, X plus, okay, so this tells us, for instance, from this condition, that uh, del plus is equal to del tau plus del sigma. That's the other way around. Uh, so, oh, okay. sorry, I did the other Let's use the chain rule meta. Let's use it right. Uh, dy b by dx a d by d. Okay, so let's choose our y's to be sigma plus and sigma minus, and our x's to be the, the tau's. So uh, tau's and sigma's. We have del tau is equal to uh, del plus plus del minus, and del sigma is equal to del plus minus. Right, because del sigma by del tau is 1, del sigma plus by del tau is 1. Plus. Okay? So you can take this and plug this in here to see that this is the same thing as del uh, plus uh, x, del minus x, and I think by 4. This is the same thing as del tau x tau squared minus del sigma x tau. Yeah, the four is because you get a factor of two when taking this square, factor of two with the other side, this square, to get four times that, you just plug in here, and that's why you need to work. Okay? So Triviality, but okay, let's keep it. Let's try to get all the factors straight. Okay. So, our action written in terms of uh, uh, plus and minus has the following interesting form 1 by pi alpha, right? The minus we absorbed, and uh, the 4 I've just cancelled, and uh, uh, del plus x mu, del minus x mu, d to zero. One by four should be on the other side. Let's see. Um, very possible. 
let's let's see. Uh, if we put in what yeah, yeah. And now is that consistent with that? Uh, yeah, it is consistent. Sorry. Good. Okay, so that's what I actually do. Let, uh, let's see what our constraint looks like in, in, in a moment. Okay, uh, this this of the action is sort of nice because it helps us solve the equation of motion very simply, as we see in a moment. And I'm familiar with this, very quickly. But okay. Uh, uh, the real reason for going to these, these variables is that this constraint becomes one simple. So let's look at what the constraint is. Okay. So this constraint here was of this form in any set of variables. So let's use it in the variables where alpha, beta, range over plus and minus. Okay? So in order to use it, I need to know what g alpha beta is in terms of plus and minus. Okay. But minus g tau squared plus g sigma squared is just identically the same as minus of d sigma plus d sigma minus. A plus b squared minus b is a squared minus b squared. Okay? Which tells us that g plus minus is equal to minus half. There's a factor of half between what we've got here and what we've got here because the metric is symmetric. There are two terms. G plus minus state is G minus plus. Which tells us that G plus minus, if we need that, is equal to uh, minus of 2. And we invert. Okay. So now let's compute, let's compute, uh, uh, let's compute uh, this constraint equation. Let's compute this constraint equation. Uh, all three compute the components. Well, the first thing we see is that the plus plus components and the minus minus components, so let's write the train equation as this minus this, as we see. The plus plus components and minus minus components are very simple. They're very simple because in our new, uh, uh, in our new set of coordinates, g plus plus is zero, g minus minus is zero, so we get no contribution from this term. Is that right? So when I say g plus minus is half, G plus plus equals zero, G minus minus. Is that clear? Okay? So, two of the constraints are very simple. Two of the constraints are very simple. The del plus of x, uh, x mu, del plus of x mu is equal to zero. And del minus of x mu, del minus of x mu is equal to zero. What is the third with constraint equation? Here? What is the constraint equation that we get by taking plus and minus? Can somebody do it without doing algebra? We've already set the answer. It's zero. So as Lovanaga pointed out, by taking plus the plus minus component in this in this coordinate system, we're taking the trace of the matrix. Uh, of these equations. And we're already saying that that should just not give us an equation, that should be an identity. Now it's a matter of keeping your wits about you. Um, it's a matter of keeping your wits about. Let's let's try uh, to see that it actually works. That it's a matter of twos and minus signs. Let, let's see if we're good enough. Okay, g alpha beta has is minus half. So that's um, okay. Great. So so okay. So let's look at the plus minus equation. So the plus minus equation is del plus x mu del minus x mu on the left hand side. Then we have minus of one fourth, because no, that, minus of half and then keep up minus half. That's g alpha beta. And then this quantity. Now this quantity was what? It was del plus x mu, del minus x mu, multiplied by g plus minus. But there were two such terms. Because del plus x mu, del minus x mu, and del minus x mu, del plus x mu. So two such terms, and g plus minus is minus two. So we get into minus four times del plus x mu, then minus x mu. Not that, I think we've got it. Okay? So minus four, zero. Okay? So in, the, in this coordinate system, it becomes explicit that there are two rather than three constraints. 
There's the plus class constraint, the minus minus constraint. The minus class constraint is nothing. Okay. Uh, fine. So let's summarize. What have, what have we got so far? We've understood that what we want to do is to quantize the action that I've written down here. Quantize this action. Okay. Uh, subject to go ahead and solve this problem, there's one more irritating but important uh, point that I have to emphasize here. And that's the point. You see, uh, we, took, we discussed at the beginning, we discussed at the beginning that uh, there may be subtleties about reaching the stage. Okay? And we talk about the effect that those subtleties have as we get, get to that part of the course. But there is a more important question that has important effect on quantization, so we must talk about it now. And that's the question of, once we have reached this gauge, have we completely exhausted our point? Our, our, our gauge freedom, or not? Do we have additional gauge redundancy left once we have reached this gauge? Okay? Now, let's see. Uh, suppose we just, we, we were asking the question in general relativity, We've taken a metric and made it flat somehow or the other, just sigma. We ask, are there coordinate redefinition? Are there coordinate changes that commute with it being flat? And there are the only very trivial ones, like Lorentz transformations. If such things, such small numbers of things, would have been But remember, our gauge freedom helps not just coordinate redefinitions with coordinate redefinitions, but also wide transformations. Okay? So, if we perform a coordinate change, that doesn't leave the metric in bed, but whose only effect on the metric is to rescale the metric by an overall function. Then that rescaling of the metric can be undone by a wire transformation. So that is also a gain symmetry now. Okay? So any, any change of coordinates, any, uh, any reparameterization of the theory, that whose effect is to perform an overall rescaling of the metric okay? uh, in this gauge okay? is, is a symmetry that we have not yet fixed. Is this clear? Such coordinate changes, such coordinate changes have a mathematical name. They, 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 the, in infinitesimal form, they are induced by what I call conformal giving brightness. So a mathematician would ask, uh, uh, for, for a mathematician, we're studying the problem of finding all the formal killing vectors in our yeah. system. Though the mathematicians, which generally try to take post conditions at infinity <laughs> for these vectors, we, for the local questions we're asking now, we're not in conditions. Okay. So, now we're going to ask the question can you think of any reparameterizations in two dimensions that change the metric? Of course, change the flat metric, but change the flat metric only by over and multiplying it by an overall function. Now, I know several of you know the answer, but for somebody who doesn't know the answer, uh, okay, uh, uh, because you've read it before, can you think of any such function? Any such way of having Okay, multiplied by constant is, 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 is such, a, such, such a, is, is an example, but there are many more. In order to help you, let me rewrite the metric in our nice words. d sigma plus, d sigma minus. This is our metric. Now, can you think of any uh, changes of coordinates that only multiply this metric by an overall function? You see, what's, what's the characteristic feature of this metric? The characteristic feature is that it has zeros here and then something here because it's symmetric that something has to be the same. All you want is some change of coordinates that will leave the structure intact. By which I mean the, there is no d sigma plus d sigma plus term. No d sigma minus d sigma minus term. Just as d sigma plus d sigma minus. 
Can you think of what the change of this metric that achieves that? Sigma plus should go to the function of sigma plus. Very good. Sigma plus being redefined to any function of sigma plus. Sigma minus being redefined to any function of sigma minus preserves this. Okay? So there is an important function worth of ambiguity. Function worth of not yet having fixed our gauge freedom completely in our problem. There are sigma plus is equal to some function, let's call it f, or sigma plus, and sigma minus is equal to some other function, let's call it g, or sigma minus, are uh, functions worth of reparameterization and variance that we have not yet fixed. Okay? Now, you might think, well, well, what happened to our argument? You know, we used three functions to fix three variables. I mean, maybe there's some discrete ambiguity in that, or some, some small ambiguity, but how, how are we left with functions work? It does, is, the, is the question clear? Sounds, sounds unreasonable to be left with as much freedom as you thought you fixed. What's the answer to that? No, no, this isn't a question independent of constraint Just, you're fixing the age. The answer to that is that we're not left with as much freedom as we as we fix, because these are functions of one variable, not two. You see, our general coordinate transformations have as reparameterization invariance three functions of two variables. Our, what we're left with is two functions of one variable. So that's much less. It's major zero in the set of functions of two variables. Okay? But yet it might be physically important. Is this clear? Okay. So, so before we just embark on a mathematical program of quantization, we have to deal with the fact that we have not yet fixed all our gates. So let's put that as point three. Need to fix unfixed gauge symmetry. Uh, uh, need to fix unfixed gauge symmetry. Uh, x me, sorry, sigma plus is equal to f of sigma plus, sigma minus is equal to g of sigma. Okay. Now, in order to emphasize to you, in order, in order to do this fixing, and also in order to emphasize to you how important this fixing is, uh, before proceeding to the quantization, I'm going to remind you of the classical solutions. The classical solution to this problem. Okay? So what do we have? Well, suppose we're going to compute the equations of motion. Suppose we're going to compute the equations of motion for x mu, we vary the action and we find del plus, del minus of x mu is equal to zero. This is a very familiar equation of motion. It's the traveling wave solution in one dimension. And we know that all the solutions to this equation of motion our x mu is equal to, let's call it x mu plus of sigma plus plus x mu minus of sigma minus. As you can easily prove for yourself. This is a set of solutions to the equations of motion. Uh, okay, great. Now, are these functions x plus and x minus completely arbitrary? But remember, we were dealing with, uh, um, with, uh, uh, with a string such that whose sigma coordinate was periodic in zero and two, between 0 and 2 pi. So, it's not completely arbitrary. We, these functions have to be periodic in, in sigma plus and sigma minus, with periodicity 0 to 2 pi, which tells us that if we were wanted to, we could expand them in, in a Fourier series with only the correct integer frequencies. Okay, we'll come to that. We'll come to the detail solving and quantization of solutions in a moment. But why I wanted to say this immediately was to emphasize how important the remaining coordinate uh, remaining gauge redundancy. You see, suppose I do, suppose I take, suppose I take this 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 gauge transformation, and I uh, apply it on a solution. Of course, I must get another solution. Okay. So what, what do I get? You know, I get the sigma plus replaced by f of sigma plus, sigma minus replaced by g of sigma minus. Okay. But you see. If we were interested in looking just at the space of solutions, we could use this coordinate redefinition of ambiguity. Then to say any particular one of these x's to something specific. 
You know, you could just use it. You see, any function of sigma plus is as good a definition of sigma plus as sigma plus itself. Provided it. there are certain global things that you know, doesn't tell that out. Right? So we we have a coordinate redefinition of mediocre in our problem. Sigma plus is only defined up to functions of itself. Sigma minus is only defined up to functions of itself. Now on shell, the solutions to the equations of motion, these things are divided up into functions of sigma plus and functions of sigma minus. Okay? So one of these coordinates could be used as a definition of sigma plus. Okay? To say it again, even before we impose any constraints, the space of inequivalent classical solutions is not suppose we want d dimensions, d space time dimensions, is not d functions of sigma plus and d functions of sigma minus, it's d minus one functions of sigma plus and d minus one functions. Is this clear? Okay? The constraints, on the other hand, remember the constraints have had this nice property that you've got one constraint for pluses and one constraint for minuses. Then plus a, a function of sigma minus is zero. So the first constraint constrains x pluses, and the second constraint constrains x, x minuses. Okay? So the constraints, on the other hand, are one more equation of, on sigma plus. So it can be used to eliminate one more solution. So the space of classical solutions of this problem, the space of classical solutions of this problem is 20. No, it, it's d minus 2. It's d minus 2 uh, functions of x plus and d minus 2 functions of x plus. Okay? If we had forgotten about the solution, uh, this redundancy, we would have got the answer d minus 1 and d minus 1, which is totally wrong. Okay? So it's a very important thing as we will see. As we will see. Now, can somebody give me a physical interpretation of d minus 2? Uh, so let me ask you the following question. Suppose I have a string, a long string, stretched in a physical three dimensional space. The string has tension, and I hit it a little bit. The, 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 the oscillations of the string, the oscillations of the string can be thought of as some number of scalar fields on the on the on the property on the string. How many scalar fields in physical space? Say it loudly. The camera should be. That's correct. It's two. The transverse degree of oscillations can oscillate that way, but can oscillate that way. You might have thought it should be three, because the three directions in space, but one of the directions is the direction in which the string is, is itself. You can oscillate there. Okay? In a physical string, you might be able to oscillate that. There might be pressure. But that's not the kind of string this is. The only one, if you, you know, there's no more sense about which part of the string is going. It's just a word line occupied by the string. So there's no sense in oscillating in the direction of the string. That's meaningless. Okay? So the number of oscillations in our problem should be d minus 2. That's what we're finding. And it's very good, because, you, because nothing else would have made sense. Uh, so you're assuming that the number of forms of spatial directions is 3 ways. Well, in the little toy question I gave you, the, that was the assumption. But uh, you can easily in your mind now hype that up to d, to d space time dimension. And the answer would be d minus 2. You can't oscillate in time, you can't oscillate in the direction of the strip. The remaining directions, you can oscillate. So that's d minus 2. Is this clear? Fine. So now, so that's all I want to say about rough analysis of classical motion. Now we're going to perform, we're going to use all the intuition we've gathered to try to perform a quantization of the string. But questions or comments before we proceed. Questions or comments? Can you just go over the argument for d minus 2? The physical argument or the argument for form it? No, physical argument. The physical argument was this. See, suppose you've got a, st a string occupying a certain, you know, a certain position, and you have to ask what they, you want, you want to write. There are no invariances, I mean, uh, uh, translational invariances along the string, or there's no tra there's not no necessary translational invariance along the string. But you see, if you ask where can a little bit of the string move, it can move in that direction, or it can move in that direction. If it moves here, that is yeah. changing the shape of the string, and so it's not counted as a new shape. You see, because only degree of free, the, the, the variables of string theory are what path in space time the string occupies. There's no sense of what part of the, you know, the our string isn't made up of atoms we can label. There's no question of which atom is where. 
The only thing we can say about the string is what space-time curve it is occupying. So if you try to move the string along its own shape, that's not changing that space-time curve. Is this clear? Okay? That's 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 the physical argument, and we've seen we've seen it formally from here. And we will see more clearly, I think. Yes. Uh, is the consequence of this uh, y symmetry and the parameter exactly. exactly. In this particular gauge, right? In this particular gauge. It, 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 you could choose some crazy gauge in which these symmetries have completely different consequences for that gauge. Yes. But uh, the yeah. voice uh, our comment was completely right. You see, uh, we argued that coordinate transformations whose only effect was to rescale the metric are a symmetry of, are, are a, an unfixed reparametrization plus y symmetry of our problem. Now, there's a second name for coordinate trans transformations whose only effect is to rescale the metric, and that they call conformal transformations. So, one, something that we conclude in general general grounds is that the theory of the world sheet of the string, this theory that we study, must be conformal field theory in the gauge of the Okay? Very good. Other questions about it? So now let's 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 move on. Okay. So in order to do the quantization, of course, we first have to deal with the unfixed gauge symmetries, the unfixed gauge symmetries of our problem. Okay. So before we actually start doing it, I, I want to give you one one bit of uh, one bit of orientation. You see, uh, the orientation has to do with the nature of phase space in any classical system. Phase space is something that you are familiar with as a space parametrized by positions and momenta of the dynamical variables of the system. But that's just one way of describing phase space and not the best way, not the best and most invariant way to describe it. So why are we interested in positions and canonical momenta? We're interested in positions and canonical momenta because they constitute the full set, you know, once you take down all constraints that happen to be in the problem, they constitute the full set of initial conditions for classical dynamics. Okay? As you know, you specify a coordinate and a, and a velocity. Velocity is essentially a moment. Okay? But initial conditions are in one to one correspondence with the solutions of the theory. For every initial condition, there's a solution. So the best way to think of phase space is to think of it as the space of classical solutions. Okay. That's what the phase space of the system is. It's a space of classical solution. Okay. Okay? And when you quantize phase space, where quantization is a procedure of, of associating an operator algebra, a Hilbert space operator uh, algebra, with phase space. So there's an intimate, of course, connection between the classical motion of the system and the quantum motion of the system. The connection, in one way of phrasing it, goes through, find the set of all classical solutions, that's phase space, and then quantize it. Okay, so that, that's what we, that's the procedure we're now going to try to implement. We've already seen that the phase space of, the sys of our system is made up of 24 functions of x plus sigma plus and 24 functions of sigma minus. So that's the kind, that's the, the quantization should reflect that that that, that that problem. Okay, so let's let's now try to move more formally. The, fo the formal procedure goes like this: we see that we have please. Oh, sorry. Uh, D minus two, D minus two. I'm not used to it. Yes. Um, yeah. now, now let's move forward. Uh, let's move forward more, uh, more forward. We now get fixed this gauge invariant. <laughs> okay. So let's fix it by choosing a particular slice of phase space. Okay. So all our space of solutions. We've got this equivalence that we talked about. And we want to fix this, this equivalence. So on the space of on the space of solutions, we've got the equivalence, and I'm going to fix it by doing something um, that you might think is a little weird. Uh, but it was hit upon by trial and error, and it's a good thing to do. Uh, okay, so let me define x0 minus x plus xd as equal to x plus and x d minus. 0 minus x d. 
minus 1 is equal to x minus. Now, this, this whole thing gets confusing because there are two things going on. The space time, the place where the string is moving, and there's the virtue of the string. X is, remember, our coordinates for the space time. Sigma is our coordinates for the virtue of the string. So the two are different. Okay? We use light cone variables, sigma plus, sigma minus, in space, in, in on the virtue. Now, we're going to do something a little weird. We're going to break explicit Lorentz invariance in space time. Okay? The, what, I'm doing, what I'm doing now is analog of the second way of quantizing that we had yesterday. The way of taking this nice Lorentz invariant action and saying, well, let me use tau as time. Everything was very clear then, but it wasn't explicitly Lorentz. Okay? So, in order to get at, uh, in order to, uh, to do the fastest route to quantization, I'm going to do that. I'm going to break explicit Lorentz invariance of the action by firstly choosing out one special spatial coordinate, the d minus 1 one, combining it with x naught and say plus x plus, combining this with, a, with the minus sign and say plus x minus. So far, I've done nothing to relate the coordinates. But, where I do something is saying, let me choose the gauge to, on the space of solutions, fix my retard naturalization immediately. Let me choose the gauge. So x minus is equal to alpha prime p minus uh, uh, Okay, then this, this is the final gauge I'm going to fix, but I'll say it in a way that makes it sound less, less arbitrary. Firstly, what is P minus at the moment? It's some undetermined number. I will convince you in a moment that P minus cannot be fixed. Cannot. We don't have freedom to rescale P minus. That's not the answer. So we need a, a, an ambiguous number that parameterizes different. Different P minus will give you different solutions. Physically different solutions. But uh, let me write this better as X minus plus the right moving part. Okay, we clear it. Yeah. X minus plus is equal to alpha prime p minus into sigma plus by two. And x minus minus is equal to alpha prime p minus into sigma minus. Remember, every solution to the equation of motion was some function of sigma plus and some function of sigma minus. This statement, how do I make tau a function of sigma plus and sigma minus? Well, tau is equal to sigma plus plus sigma minus by 2. Okay? So, rewritten tau equals sigma plus plus sigma minus by 2. And then I use that to identify what I meant by. So, this statement is equivalent to this statement. Is this clear? Okay? So, what have I done by making this gauge fixing? What I've done is to say, well, remember x minus of x plus of minus was in general an arbitrary function of sigma minus. And I'm going to choose my reparameterization freedom to make, to say that that function of sigma minus is now sigma minus times a constant. Is this clear? Is this clear? My read? No. You see, what did I have in my hand? I had reparameterization of the just changing sigma, sigma plus to any function of sigma plus. Okay, but now on the space of classical solutions, I have d different functions of sigma plus. x1 is a function of sigma plus, x2 is a function of sigma plus, or maybe xd minus 1 is a function of sigma plus. Okay, now in studying classical solutions, I, I could choose the following gauge. You know, suppose you get, there, there were these 20, there were these d different functions of sigma plus, but I could use my sigma plus a reparameterization immediately to choose any one of those functions to be my new sigma plus. Once I've done that, that new function is one. Well, I've done it with x minus actually. It's x0 plus x d minus 1. That's why I have to pretend it. I could have done it with x0. Conceptually, I could have, this is just how I pretend it. Okay? So that's all I've done. I've taken x plus and said whatever that is, that's my new definition of sigma plus. Up to this constant, we talk to the constant. And whatever x minus was, x, you see that's that's the problem with talking about this. There's a minus and a plus and a minus and a minus. Uh, x minus plus for sigma plus, x minus minus for sigma minus. Up to the constant. Okay, 
I'm using this reparameterization ambiguity to do this. Now, now is this clear? This the, this this p minus and p, uh, p minus and some, 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 this is just some number which we make. Okay. Now, why this number? Why could I just set it to be sigma plus? The point is that our, our reparameterization ambiguity wasn't complete. Wasn't complete because there's one thing about the sigma coordinate that we know. Namely, that all the functions are periodic with periodicity, periodicity two pi and sigma. Okay, and you should know a coordinate should change. You do that. You should change that. So if in some variable, <coughs> if in some variable your functions were periodic to periodicity to pi, if you make a coordinate redefinition that respects that periodicity, then you're safe. But if you make a coordinate redefinition that breaks the periodicity, you know, then, then you're not. For instance, a rescaling of sigma breaks the periodicity. Because it takes periodicity to pi to periodicity to pi times that rescaling amount. Okay? But if I'm going to try to, um, if I'm going to try to, set, to change this constant here, what I would be doing is changing each of these functions by constant. But the variable sigma is just, you know, sigma plus minus sigma minus. So that would also be changed by constant. Okay. So I don't have enough quadratic definition freedom in my hand to soak up the zero mode part. The zero mode part of what x minus was. Is this clear? Let me say this there. Let's remember we said that the most general solution, the most general solution, okay, of uh, of any of these x's and therefore of x minus because of this form. Let's forget about the x sigma minus in what I'm saying for a moment. Look at just sigma plus. Okay. Now this was a periodic solution. So x mu, what we have is that x mu plus can be written in terms of of, uh, of Fourier modes. So we could write this at n at n not equal to zero into pi i n sigma plus times some number. Let's say beta to pi. Then sorry. Okay. Now in addition, of course, we could also we could we don't need n not equal to zero to be constant. That's fine. Sum over all a. But there's one more thing we can do that also solves the equations of motion. Uh, apparently. Okay? And that one more thing that we can do is to add to it a constant times sigma. Sigma plus. Well, now this doesn't respect the symmetry. Because when you take sigma, sigma plus 2 pi, sorry, oh, okay. Yeah, we can add to this plus some constant times sigma plus. This by itself doesn't respect the symmetry. But remember we also had x minus in our hands. So if we chose a constant in x plus and the constant in x minus to be the same, then the sigma part cancels between the two. You see, x is then just a function of tau. And then it does respect the symmetry of the problem. Okay? So, we are only going to allow ourselves redefinitions of sigma plus and sigma minus that respect the periodicity of sigma, which allows us to set all these terms to zero, but doesn't allow us to fool around with this term. Okay? So this constant, whatever it is, can't be changed. <laughs> okay? So this is a physical object, and I've called it P minus. Why I call it P minus will become clear very soon, but at the moment it's just some number. Parameterizing different inequalities in terms. Is this clear? So I have parameter. I have now looked at the phase space of my problem, namely the space of all inequivalent classical solutions, and characterized it by solutions of twenty by twenty d minus one by d minus one d minus one different uh, functions of uh, sigma plus and sigma minus. Okay, because I set one of these functions to something specific. It's not quite something specific. This number which can parameterize as inequivalent solutions. Is this clear? Okay, great. Now, the next question I want to ask is, now that I've fixed this gauge, now that I've fixed this gauge in my theory, can I just plug it into the action? Or do I have to worry about the equivalent of the constraints that come from fixing this gauge? 
Is this clear? That's the question. Now, let's see. Let's see. The constraints from fixing a gauge are always equations of motion that would have followed had you not fixed this gauge. So we want to know what are the equations that come from varying, uh, varying x minus. Can somebody tell me what are the equations that come from varying x minus? x minus where minus is in space. The minus is in space. You get an equation for x plus. Exactly. So, the equation of motion that, that comes from varying with respect to x minus, as I'll give you the check, is the Laplace equation that plus then minus of x plus. Okay? So, if we were just to plug in our solution into the action, that would be fine if we were already also to impose this condition that x plus satisfies the Laplace equation. It's a function of x, sigma plus sigma minus. However, now we're in luck. We're in luck because we don't independently have to specify this constraint because it follows from the earlier constraints that we have. Remember, remember that our earlier constraint was del plus. Well, okay, maybe, maybe that's an inaccurately said. Maybe that's an But maybe it's more accurate to say, say the following. Suppose we do impose this as a constraint. We say that x, 20, x plus is the sum of sigma plus and sigma minus. Then that function of sigma plus and sigma minus that we get for x plus is completely determined by the other constraints. Okay, why is that? Okay, see, we have what are what, what are the constraints? Look like? The constraints look like del plus x plus del plus x minus plus sum over i del plus of x i del plus x i, where i runs over all the remaining d minus two coordinates, the coordinates that are not plus or minus. Okay, now we chose a fixed gauge. Such that del plus of, uh, of x minus is equal to alpha p minus uh, by two. So we have been told, therefore, that del plus of x plus is equal to two by alpha p minus into sigma of i del plus x i del plus. Okay, so if we just treat this as the solution, you know, if we just treat this as the solution of what x plus is, of what x plus is, you know, given what the other i's are doing, that solution automatically, I mean, obviously obeys the fact that it's a function only of sigma, sigma plus. The minus part of it obeys the fact that it's a function of sigma minus. Okay, so. Now what have we done? We have okay. We've used the fact that we know that that x plus must be a function of sigma plus and sigma minus only. Put in that fact plus the earlier constraint to completely solve for x plus in this gauge. Completely solve is a little inaccurate. We have not solved for the zero mode of x plus. You see, we only have solved for that part of x plus that is. Uh, uh, that is visible in the derivative expansion. But x plus will have constant piece. Just some constant piece that we have not we have not solved for. Uh, this but, but almost, apart from that one constant term, term independent of sigma plus, we've completely solved for x plus in terms of the motion of the other d minus two coordinates in this case. Is this clear? Okay? Questions or comments? Fine. So now we're going to ask a question. Now we're going to ask a question. Um, having done all this babu ba, can we now write down a simplified action? Okay, for a dynamical system that has the same solutions, you know, that is dynamically equivalent to the system that we started, namely 
an action that has all the same solutions, an action that has uh, all the same solutions to the equations of motion as the one we want. Okay? Well, you see, because solutions to the equations of motion are parametrized just by uh, x i's and by this one number p minus, also by so zero one part not in the moment. Okay? If, if we were interested in writing down an efficient action, if we were interested in writing down an efficient action, the action should just not have x plus and x minus in it. Okay? Maybe another, another way to say it is take the action of uh, maybe another way to say it is to take the action of the theory that we had and just plug in the gauge. Plug in the gauge finish. Okay? And check to see whether varying the equations of motion that follow from that action, the equations of motion that follow from that action, are the equations, you know, uh, give, give us the solutions that we want. Okay? So, I may have said this confusingly, let me say it again. Uh, if we took the original action that we had, and we plugged in our, uh, our, our gauge condition, in alpha prime, x, prime, x minus is equal to constant times b minus times tau. Okay? Then the only thing we're losing from that is the equations of motion, is the equations of motion that follow uh, for x plus. However, putting in those equations of motion, saying that x plus is a function of sigma uh, of, uh, uh, of sigma plus and sigma mi minus independently. Plus the constraints allow us simply to determine x plus. This whole process does not back react on x i's. Okay? The full classical dynamical system is an arbitrary, arbitrary left moving, right moving functions of x i, and all that the system does is determine what x plus is doing in terms of what x i is doing. Okay? So, so basically, the conclusion we is that it would be legitimate in this situation just to take the action we had and plug in our gauge. Okay? Once we've done this, we can even forget, we can even forget about our constraint equations. Because the constraint equations don't constrain the dynamical degrees of freedom that remain, just relates other degrees of freedom to these guys. Why do we care? Okay, there is one degree of freedom that we would be wrong uh, in doing this well, which we don't. Okay, so let's move. So what do we going to do? So we have 1 by pi alpha prime. Okay. Uh, okay, let me go back to slightly go back. So our action was equal to 1 by minus 1 by 4 pi. Okay, let's write it. 1 by 4 pi alpha prime. And we had x x mu dot x mu dot minus x mu prime x mu prime. This is equal. This was our action. Into this action we put the gauge, we put the gauge condition. We put the gauge condition. Okay? Uh, yeah. Oh. Into, in, into the action we put the gauge condition that okay, I'll, I'll come back to zero once in a moment. But that essentially eliminates, you know, what, what does it do? It makes, uh, we put in uh, a condition such that x, so, so there's part of this that is x plus x minus, and there's part of this that is x i x i. Okay, let's start in the x, x plus x minus part. You see, all that survives here in the x plus x minus part are zero more contributions. You see, suppose you took x plus and Fourier expanded it. In, in, in modes of the circle, and x minus and Fourier expanded in modes of the circle, we set all the non-trivial, non-zero Fourier modes of x minus to zero. <laughs> but in this integral, the only way you can get something non-zero is if a Fourier mode with momentum k clicks to the Fourier mode with momentum minus k. So the action that remains is an action only for the zero modes of x plus and x minus. Is this clear? So there, there's no action remaining for the oscillator modes of, R, of x minus. That's why it can be. The gauge picks that zero. 
or all the oscillator modes for X plus, they just don't enter the action. Okay? XIs are just not affected by what's going on. So the final conclusion that I want to that I wanted to draw is the following. Is what follows. Is C. Uh, if you take the action 1 over 4 pi alpha prime, if you take the action 1 over 4 pi alpha prime, x plus dot, uh, x minus dot times 2 pi, uh, integral d t plus d2 sigma xi xi uh, uh, dot squared minus xi prime squared uh, close bracket. And then, then this is the full dynamic action for the dynamical degrees of freedom left. Okay, this is the full remaining you know, full action uh, for the degrees of freedom with uh, of interest. Okay, what was this x dot and x minus? These were zero modes. So we took x and we expanded this as, uh, as just a function of sigma, or not sigma tau. We took x plus and we expanded it as x, x plus uh, sum over n x plus into pi n sigma. We've already argued that all the modes with, with non-zero n drop out. This is the mode with n equals zero. The two pi is come from the, doing the integral uh, of over sigma. Yeah, in, in two minutes. Okay, great, great, great. Okay, so, 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 sorry. So, so, what, okay, so the net conclusion then is that we, we're interested in the action one over two alpha prime, uh, x plus dot, x minus dot, Plus one over four pi alpha plus plus one over four pi alpha prime uh, uh, x i dot the whole thing squared minus x i prime the whole thing squared into sigma. Okay, this action is to be supplemented with one remaining constraint. The one constraint that was not that was not completely uh, redundant when we did this whole thing. That, that one constraint is the zero mode part of this constraint. Why is that? Why, why is that that this one constraint is left behind? Okay, the one constraint is left behind basically because of this. You see, as we will see when we do the quantization of the system, this one solution couples to one degree of freedom in x plus. Okay, so that part of x plus is not redundant. Then if you look at, uh, when you look at this, the symplectic form, the, the Poisson brackets between degrees of freedom in our system, x plus oscillators have Poisson brackets with x plus oscillators. So by throwing away x plus, most x plus degrees of freedom, we're not doing anything bad. However, the zero mode of x minus couples with the zero mode of x plus. So if we want a quantum system, we want to build a quantum system out of a, 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 out of a classical system that has solutions parametrized by a number in the zero mode sector of x minus. We need to include in that quantum system the zero mode of x plus. Okay? And the remaining constraint, the one remaining constraint, is going to tell us, it allows us to, you know, gives us the constraint that links the dynamics of zero mode of x plus with zero mode of x minus. Okay. So we've basically run out of time. And I know this has been confusing. It's been confusing for two reasons. Okay, it's been confusing for two reasons. One of which is that we're trying to take shortcuts. You know, we're trying not to give you, give the full detailed justification, okay, of, of the result I'm trying to reach. Okay? Now, that is of course a very unsatisfactory way to proceed, and it won't remain. You know, in the next few lectures, I'll give you a much better derivation, a much better derivation of this action. Nonetheless, you know, the way physics is actually done is it's only 20 years after the work is originally done that people come up with good derivations of, of the results. 
Okay? So it, is, it would be uh, it is uh, uh, it would be silly to not pay attention to slightly shady but intuitively correct ways of proceeding. Because that's how you always do physics. Okay? So uh, 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 what I would like is all of you to think through everything we've talked about today on its own terms. Okay? And think about it and come with questions next class about it. Okay? I'll, in, in, the, in the first 10 minutes of the next class, I'll review the logic of what we went through. And then, uh, then we will start by using this to derive the spectrum of the uh, Okay? Uh, actually, the second reason I think it's been confusing is that the logic of this procedure actually relies on a way of thinking of systems. Uh, on, on the way of thinking of phase space of a system that's slightly un, un, non-standard. So, okay, please think about this as carefully as you can. In the first 10 minutes of the next class, we'll have a question-answer session where we'll review the logic in detail and you will attack it and I'll try to defend it. Okay, great. Thank you. So you're saying the main result is this action over here, right? The main result, anything, but, uh, this action supplemented by the zero mode of this condition. 